Welcome to York. York, known as the capital of Yorkshire, has a rich and varied history that goes all the way back to the Romans, who settled here and called it Iboricum in 71 AD. Then, in the Anglo-Saxon period, it was known as Eoforwick, before being known as Jorvik in the Viking era by 866, which meant Wild Boar Creek. It wasn't until the 1200s did we officially see the word York being used to describe this magnificent city. And that's what York really is. It's a beautiful and fantastic place, not only to come visit and learn about, but also to live here and be a part of the community. But York is renowned all over the world, not just in England, for its architecture, heritage and places to come and visit and see. This is what we're here to do today. This is York like you've never never seen it. This is York Unlocked. We're here in the Shambles in York, one of the best preserved medieval streets in the world, going back to even the Doomsday Book. It is thought to get its name from the word shamel, meaning benches or stalls where meat was stored, as this was actually a butcher's street originally. The Shambles is one of York's most well-known locations and a real tourist hotspot, but thanks to York Unlocked, many more places across the city are throwing open their doors, welcoming visitors to come discover their stories. York Unlocked is a not-for-profit CIC which organised this weekend-long event of opening up buildings of merit to the public free of charge. The goal of York Unlocked is to host a yearly weekend event wherein people can visit this wonderful city and find some of its hidden historical gems. So without further ado, let's go to our first spot together. Our first stop is at the York Medical Society, who reside here at 23 Stonegate. York Medical Society was founded in 1832 with the purpose of promoting and diffusing medical knowledge. It existed two years before York Medical School and its first president was Baldwin Wake. At the time they met at the York Dispensary before moving around the city. Ultimately in 1915 they moved here to 23 Stonegate. Stonegate is situated above the Roman Street via Pretoria the main street in York during the Roman period. 23 Stonegate is a 16th century Grade II listed building and its 1590 rainwater head is the oldest in the city. It was owned by the Anderson family since the 1700s. This included housing the consulting suite of a certain Tempest Anderson. He has a room dedicated to him and his achievements here. He was also born in this house in 1846 and his dining room is now the Society's lecturing theatre. He was an eye surgeon at York County Hospital, a volcanologist and photographer. He was then the Sheriff of York and President of York Medical Society before his death in 1913. In 1944, the Society bought this property. Then, in 2018, it was sold to the York Conservation Trust but still being used by the society. The society kicks off its programme every year with a public oration. The first, in 1890, was by Sir Jonathan Hutchinson, and the one in 2021 was Dr Heather Bonney. Although originally built as either two or three houses, it has seen many changes in its life, including the library that was built in 1804 by Henry Anderson. We're very much a social function now as, as well as academic and a medical. So we've got kind of three strands really. We've got ac academia, uh, we've got medical, and we've also got social as well. Um, and we're expanding. 
you know, we're, we're, we're looking beyond medical borders, we're bringing in allied professionals as well within York. Uh, one of the key things we do is, is um, uh, get involved with the local, with um, charitable uh, purposes. So for instance this year we're supporting York Food Bank as, as a local charity, St John's Ambulance uh, as a national and the, and the um, Ukraine deck. And, and we've got events supporting all of that, all that effort. Uh, so w we have that purpose. Uh, we're kind of getting a, a bit more involved with some of the local um, uh, or other org organisations in York. So for instance today we're going as a group to York Minster for Evensong to commemorate uh, St Luke's Day, which is the Medic's Day. Uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and we're very involved as well with um, medical students and junior doctors because we do elective uh, presentations and, and prizes each year. And we also, with the junior doctors, we support them in their research and they do research presentations and they get prizes as well. So we like to think we're at the centre of things, if not the, I wouldn't say we're the most important part of, uh, of uh, medical life in York, but we're, we're somewhere in the middle. The other thing I'd like to say, that these rooms are available to the public. Uh, you, can, you can use the rooms for, um, for uh, events. We have gardens within the centre of York, which are very private, and we have several meeting rooms with complete AV, uh, facilities so uh, and you know Wi-Fi and all that so we're quite modern uh, so it's like a combination of ancient and modern so it's it's pretty good it's it's quite impressive the next location we're going to is the Warmgate bar the word Warmgate was first coined as Walbergate with Walber potentially being a Scandinavian name and gate coming from the Norse word gat or garter meaning path. Warmgate was, in medieval times, a sea fish and cattle market. The term bar literally refers to the bars or gates that would have kept people out. Now, a place like this is pretty easy to miss, given it blends in so well with the fantastic architecture that makes up a lot of York. Yet this Warmgate Bar is one of the four main medieval entrances to the city. In fact, it's one of the most complete of them too. In fact, it's one of the only town gates in the entire country to still have an intact Barbican. The Barbican gets its name from the low Latin word Barbicana, which meant fortified gateway. The stone archway is the oldest part of this building as it was built in the 1100s, which is also when it first was mentioned by name as Wallgate Bar. Then in the 1300s, the Barbican was built. Then in the 1400s, the oak gates were added. Finally, in the 1500s, the plaster building with timber was added, which today acts as a cafe. Then, in the 1400s, Warmgate Bar actually came under attack. In 1489, the Yorkshire Rebellion broke out. The cause was high taxation, as the King needed £100,000 to fund a campaign to keep a Brittany independent. To put that in perspective in today's money, that's about £67 million. Yorkshire people were especially resentful of this tax. Not only had they been hard hit by a horrible harvest, and other northern counties were also exempt, but it was implemented by a Lancastrian monarch, the first Tudor king, Henry VII. So, obviously, the tax was not welcomed. Henry Percy, the fourth Earl of Northumberland, was to find this out the hard way. On the 28th of April, the 4th Earl of Northumberland came here to collect the taxes, but he was already actually quite disliked here, having betrayed Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. Thus, when he did come here to collect the taxes, he was greeted by an angry mob, who proceeded to attack and kill him. They then set about burning Warmgate Bar. Sir John Egremont led the York rebels, 
but the Earl of Surrey squashed the rebellion. Henry VII found no other real problems in the north following this, but he didn't really get all the taxes that he actually wanted. It's a miracle Warngate Bar is still standing then, especially considering it was also attacked during the English Civil War. York was fiercely royalist during the English Civil War. From the 26th of April until the 16th of July 1644, York was besieged by parliamentary and Scottish forces. The royalist troops, under the control of the Marquess of Newcastle, had to swear an oath and their food was rationed. York was in for the long haul. Thomas Fairfax, who led the parliamentary forces, raised batteries on Lamel Hill near Warmgate and also near St. Lawrence's Church. These bombarded the city defences, including Clifford's Tower, which housed two of the city's guns. It of course also bombarded Warmgate Bar. Being such a prominent gateway to the city, it is no surprise that Warmgate Bar was heavily damaged by fire from the nearby batteries. Plans to damage the bar by mining underneath it, however, were foiled by the city governor at the time, Sir Thomas Glenham. He found out about the parliamentary plans, dug just above the attackers, and then poured water on the incoming besiegers. However, the writing was on the wall for York at this stage. Knowing that York could not hold out much longer, the Marquess of Newcastle sent out for assistance from Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Parliamentary forces met with royalist forces at the nearby village of Long Marston, whilst the Marquess met with Prince Rupert in York. Then, on the 2nd of July 1644, one of the largest battles ever fought on British soil took place not far from where I'm standing. The Battle of Marston Moor was a turning point in the English Civil War. It was the first major royalist defeat, with most of the royalist soldiers fleeing back to York, pursued by parliamentary forces. By the 16th of July, a lot of civilians and soldiers had fled York. It was then surrendered to the parliamentarians, and the Fairfaxes looked after the city. The city was scarred by burnt properties and damage from cannon fire, as was Warmgate Bar. Restoration of Warmgate Bar was in 1648, with further repairs happening in 1840 following neglect. What I love about Warmgate Bar is that whilst it's juxtaposed against the hustle and bustle of city life and the roads and the busy way of modern living, it is also a shining example of some of the fantastic architecture that makes up this beautiful city. But more than that, it also tells the tale of different time periods across York's history, showing that York has so much to offer. All you have to do is look. Our next destination is the St. Martin cum Gregory Church in Micklegate. Of course, one of the first things that catches your eye when you arrive here at the church is this stunning and unique red brick tower. This actually dates back to the 17th century and makes it one of the youngest parts of the church. The tower is unique, but then again, so is the name. St. Martin cum Gregory, the name of this church, dates back to 1585, when the parish of St. Martin amalgamated with the parish of St. Gregory. Situated in Micklegate, meaning Great Street, this church dates back to the Norman times, with the nave being built in the 11th century, and with this church being made of rubble stone. The north porch was added in 1655, and then in 1677, the west tower was in dire need of repair, and thus the red bricks were added that stand before us today to make sure it survived. In 1844, the top part of the tower was repaired, and then in 1875, the whole church was restored as well. Let's take a look inside, as there's a lot of interesting things in there. 
The aisles to the nave were added in the late 1100s. The north aisle was founded in the same time, but the current width dates back to the 1300s. The chancel, chapels and arcades were rebuilt in the 1400s, and the clerestory was added in this time too, along with the nave having its roof heightened. There is also a font from this period of time too, but the cover is from the 1700s. Also from the 1700s, near the entrance, is a poor box, which was a collection box for the poor, and near that are also some bread shelves from the same time. However, one of the most famous attractions here is the stained glass, some of which was made by William Peckett. William Peckett was a York-based Georgian glass painter and was renowned across the country. Talking of stained glass, since 2008, this church has been the home of the Stained Glass Centre. So the centre was set up about 15 years ago as a place to study and also to practice uh, the craft of stained glass. York obviously is a fantastic place to see stained glass and, and to, to visit sites like the Minster, but also its parish churches. And this parish church is filled with stained glass from the 14th century to the 20th century. So we have organised study days where people can come and uh, paint, learn how to paint stained glass. Um, we have had lectures and uh, organised visits around uh, the city so that people can enjoy the extraordinary stained glass heritage in the city. It's been incredibly busy, literally, since we opened the doors at 10.30. We've had non-stop people coming through. And what's incredible about the York and Locks is it's a completely different range of people, probably, that would have never dreamt of coming here. So people have been not only excited to see what, what uh, St. Martin Cum Gregory um, holds inside its doors, but also all the amazing fragments we're selling. You know, we want to get everybody to have a taste of stained glass and something they can take home with them. Our final destination, situated on the banks of the River Ouse, this is the Guildhall. This Guildhall here in York is a Grade 1 listed building. The purpose of a Guildhall was housing meetings for guilds or local governing bodies. Guilds were medieval associations of craftsmen and merchants with considerable influence and power. York Guildhall is the oldest of its kind in the entire country as it was built by 1459. However, the history of this magnificent building goes back much further than that. The first mention of a hall here, the Common Hall, was in a charter of Henry III in 1256. The hall was then built by 1459 for the Guild of St. Christopher and St. George and the city corporation who took over the whole site in 1549. In the 1400s there existed 80 guilds, with the most powerful being the Weaver's Guild. This guild hall, however, wasn't just used for meetings, it also served other purposes throughout its life, including being used as a court. One notable trial was the trial of a woman named Margaret Clitheroe. Named the Pearl of York, Margaret Clitheroe was a Catholic who lost her life defending her faith. She married John Clitheroe, a butcher on the shambles. He had another job, however. The other job was reporting Catholic worshippers to the authorities, and this was a job that went directly against Margaret's beliefs. Margaret was a recusant. This comes from the Latin word recusary, which means to refuse. Recusancy was a crime, and a recusant was someone who refused to attend mandatory church services following the English Reformation. Margaret was imprisoned in York Castle for her recusancy, but was ultimately trialled here at York Guildhall. Because she refused to be trialled by a jury, she was automatically sentenced to death. They took her to the Ouse Bridge, where she was sentenced to be pressed to death. They placed about 900 pounds of weight, which is about the weight of a female polar bear, upon her body, and she was crushed to death. Whilst Margaret's tale is tragic, 
she was not the only famous person to have been in this place. Richard III and Prince Albert have visited here and was allegedly the site where the £200,000 ransom for Charles I was counted. However, much later in the Guildhall's life, it was visited by a much more insidious group of people, the Luftwaffe. When we think of York, we rarely think of the Second World War. Yet, on the 29th of April 1942, the Guildhall, amongst other buildings, was savagely attacked by the German Luftwaffe. This was part of a wider, more strategic campaign. This was a second, more forgotten about blitz. This was the Baedeker Blitz. Baedeker gets its name from a German tourist map of England, and the targets were chosen for their cultural significance and for being cathedral cities. The raids were allegedly a response to RAF bombing of the German city of Lübeck. The Baedeker Blitz lasted from April 1942 until June and targeted Norwich, Exeter, Bath, York and Canterbury. York was targeted at least 11 times during the Second World War, but this night, the 29th of April 1942, was by far the bloodiest attack. 92 people died from York in the Baedeker Blitz, with the oldest being 77 years old and the youngest being just 10 months old. The Guildhall was one of the buildings desecrated during the Blitz. Incendiaries that were used by the Luftwaffe to damage property and light the way for bombers tore through the building and flames desecrated this magnificent interior. It also destroyed the exceptionally high quality stained glass windows that had been one of the most remarkable sights of this place since 1682. Following the war, it took 18 years for the interior and the windows to be repaired. The old windows originally showed the arms of York, as well as various images associated with the historic city. The panes of windows that survive today from 1960 also speak to different themes about York's history and culture too. Starting from the far right, the first image shows religious imagery and education, as well as the baptism of King Edwin. Moving left, the next one shows a medieval fair and commerce. The third in the middle shows the coat of arms of York. The fourth shows military and a depiction of the Baedeker Blitz. The final one on the far left shows architecture and the York Minster towards the top. Speaking of the top, the important figures at the top there are important, famous people commonly associated with York's history, with Constantine in the top row and King Edward III in the second, to name just two. In April 2022, the Guildhall finished another phase of restoration. This time, a £20 million refurbishment gave way to offices, event spaces, community usage, better access for visitors, a cafe and a restaurant. One thing I love about this building is that it speaks to York's varied and rich history and covers many time periods, showing that York has so much more to offer than people even realise today. One thing that absolutely fascinates me is the fact that this Guildhall has stood the test of time and I think it's really important and really lovely to know that it's still being cared for, not just for today, but for generations to come. And it is a shining piece of evidence that historic buildings can be made useful for the community outside of their original purpose and that people really care about their local heritage. And it's really great to see that such an interesting building is being opened up to the public so they can find out its fascinating story. York is filled with fantastic buildings, exceptional heritage 
and places with great stories and great interest. I've shown you only a few of the over 60 places that York Unlocked allowed me and countless others to gain access to over this fantastic weekend. So, here's to next year and the year after that, where me, you and everyone can come celebrate the fantastic history of York thanks to the efforts of York Unlocked. <laughs>